Okay, so should we start now? We, we have around 25 participants. They're coming up more and more, but uh, I'll include them into the meeting. So uh, first of all, I want to say good morning, right? And uh, thank you all for being here uh, with us today for this one hour webinar on data protection. Um, so today's objective is to provide you with uh, an update uh, around the Swiss Federal Act on data protection, but not only, as we will also talk about European and American regulations. So please bear in mind that uh, there is a chat here, which is available. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free. And we'll try to address some of these at the end of the webinar. So before starting, I will now let our dear speakers present themselves. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Uh, my name is Caroline Perriar, and I am the co-CEO of Branded. Branded is a company who is providing legal consultancy in um, regards to data protection and intellectual property. So we are advising companies in their digital transformation, their e-commerce um, campaigns, and the, any other, um, let's say, projects that include data as an asset of the company and IP on the other hand. And uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. So uh, I'm Julia Lustig, and uh, I am a, a solutions engineer uh, based in Paris for uh, OneTrust. So OneTrust is uh, one of the global leaders in terms of uh, privacy. So we uh, create solutions to help companies uh, stay compliant and use that as a competitive advantage. Thank you, Julia. And my name, I am your host and speaker today, is Giancarlo Avoglio. I am a manager at Columbus Consulting, and uh, we assist companies and organizations uh, from the launch to the delivery of their data initiatives. So uh, we have a broad experience and expertise on this matter, ranging from data governance and privacy to management, analytics, and much more. So should we start now our presentation? I have automated all people joining us. So if you will, without further ado, let's have a look at our agenda for today. So we have our first 30 minutes in which we will review what's new around uh, data protection with a focus on the impacts of the revision of the Swiss FADP. The following 15 minutes, we will see how software solutions such as One Trust can help accelerate compliance. And then uh, for the last, let's say 10, 15 minutes, we'll have our Q&A session. Hope this is, is okay for all of you. So let's start without further ado, I will pass it on to Carolyn will give us an overview of what's going on around data protection today. Thank you, Giancarlo. Um, so when we talk about data protection, we talk about personal data. This is what is protected under the legislation. It's data that is identifying someone or that is making it possible to identify a person. There are different, of, um, different type of data. The first party data is the data that you collect as a company through your own campaign, through interaction with your customers. The second party data is data that is coming from your partners, um, different entities you might be sharing information with. And the third party data, this is the external data that is coming from the different providers where you also interact on with your digital marketing, the social media platforms, maybe data that you buy from a provider, you know, a list of customer name, et cetera. All of this data is um, important and needs to be protected. It's falling in your, in your bucket inside your company. It's coming from different sources. So we see it here in the middle, different platforms um, coming from, you know, mobile interaction, from analytics. At the end, we have this, um, set of data that are possible to identify someone and it's where we need protection. Yes. 
The another set we want to mention briefly here, again, because Switzerland has been changing in slow and then is at, Switzerland is adding under sensitive data, the biometrical data and the generic data. Um, is that you also need to consider your company. Where, what industry are you active in? Are you in the medical device, pharmaceutical industry? Um, are you more a B2B company? What, what is um, the matter uh, with the data you might be collected? Don't forget that you also collect sensitive data about your employees. So even if you're only active in B2B and you have less direct consumers interaction, you still have information about your employees that you need to protect. Sensitive data cannot be collected except if you have a um, specific legal basis, such as um, a consent or um, a legal ground, uh, you know, in obligation where you need um, you need to store it. Yes, Giancarlo. But what is interesting is also to understand where are we today with the legislation. You know, GDPR. You know, kind of the story. We have been um, kind of. Um, I wouldn't say partying, but enjoying the three years implementation of GDPR by asking, does that matter? Is it bringing anything to the customers and the end user? We're waiting for the e-privacy regulation. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully at the end of the year, um, the draft is ready. It needs now um, um, to be um, accepted at the EU level. The e-privacy will impact your marketed practices because it rules also how cookies and trackers are used. From, for Switzerland, we have a new law, um, so the, the Legislation Act is, uh, has been revised, is there, we're still waiting for the um, entry date, uh, so we will be able to implement it. I'm quite optimistic, so I think it will be 2022, but yesterday I was um, preparing for today, I noticed that some people were a little bit less optimistic and said 2023. Nevertheless, it means that, it doesn't mean that companies here in Switzerland can just you know, relax and think, okay, I'm waiting two, and a, two, uh, two more years because when it comes into force, then it needs, it's implemented directly. There is no transition period. So what are the differences? And we can move to the next one. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the, the fines. I wanted, before we move to the difference, I wanted to um, explain to you why it is important to look at that potential law and what are the risks. Here you have really high numbers. Some companies have been fined with large, large um, amount of, uh, of euro for not uh, respecting the law. Um, I would like to take three examples because I think they're, they're interesting. And even if your company is probably a little bit smaller than Google and maybe even smaller than, than the Facebook one, um, you will see that it's important. H&M, they've been fined because they were collecting a lot of data about the employees when the employees were coming back after holidays or sick leave. So after leave of the employee, they had some chat and then were running some kind of form asking, asking some question. This information was used for performance review, maybe thinking is the employee more motivated or less after a leave. Um, HMN were fine because first they were collecting quite a lot of sensitive data. Um, they were not um, respecting the data min minimization principle that uh, the law is asking us to do. And then the access to the data was made broadly among the managers of the firm. So here definitely violation of the rights of the employees. Tim is an Italian company of telecommunication Team has been sending overly aggressive campaigns, um, reaching out to customers by phone, sending a lot of emails. And um, it was shown that actually they had not, no control on their database of customer. So they were reaching out to people who had opted out or withdrawn, withdrawn their consent, and they were not respect, respecting the rights. So here, really violation of um, the purpose and there's all the legal basis principles. And British Airways, this is also another case of um, spoof, spoofing um, attempt by cyber, cyber attacks uh, who um, were trying, or we actually did create a website to direct um, customers of British Airways and collect that data. So they were able to um, um, have access to the customer database and redirect the traffic to a spoofing um, website. 
here definitely um, violation of uh, respect or implementation of the, the right security measures. The fines have been high and then if you're a smaller company, if, if you were to be fined in Europe, then probably the amount would be lower, but you still would be fined for the same type of um, grounds. Yes, thank you, Carla. So what are the differences? Can you say, well, we, we, you know, we comply with GDPR, we're fine with the um, federal act? Probably almost, if you're already at, already at this stage. Um, the same principle have been uh, have been taken in the new um, in the new act. The wording is a bit different, but I would say at the end of the day, we are we are the same situation. The appointment of the data protection officer is not um, required um, in a similar way as under GDPR. However, you still need to have someone internally looking at how, how data um, personal data is dealt with. Um, and then this will also avoid you to have to go back to the authorities for every um, a new project. So you also need to have a data protection, let's call it responsible internally. If you're an EU company um, and then you, are, you don't have an affiliate company in Switzerland, then you might, but you still do business, you might still have to have a representative in Switzerland, so someone who can is able to pick up the phone or open the mailbox um, if someone is complaining about your, um, your doing. And the main difference is definitely the amount of the fines. In Switzerland, the amount is limited to 250,000 Swiss franc, and, and it's targeted to uh, the CEO or the director of the company. Um, so the fine is not as deterrent as it is under um, a GDPR. Nevertheless, if you were to be um, uh, found to violate some, violate, violate some rules, then definitely the, the impact on the reputation is there. Yeah, next. Um, and a few things to, to, um, to remember here. Um, the principles are the same, the logic is a bit different in the sense that the Swiss law is saying you can process personal data, but you also need to, um, to um, I mean, you cannot do it under certain circumstances, while GDPR is more, you cannot process personal data except if you have some, uh, some um, ex exception, but at the end it's the same application. Switzerland is inserting the high risk profiling, which has a little bit of different meaning than under uh, EU um, uh, practices. However, uh, at the end of the day, again, it will be the same, um, uh, same way of looking at uh, any high risk profiling by running a data, um, data privacy impact assessment, for example. The, um, the task of the commissioners or the authorities are increasing, however, the authorities are not entitled to all the fine, but they will still be able to um, have you stop processing some data, delete some information, and they will be able to file some an administrative um, complaints before the courts. I mentioned that the um, fine will reach the, um, the director or the CEO of the company. It's a criminal complaint, so that's also very important. If you are the data protection responsible in your company, make sure your Management team knows that if something goes wrong, they will be the one challenge. And then personally, channel challenge is not just a company. Something new also is the duty to inform, which we know um, it is the privacy notice, the little disclaimer that we have on the website or when we collect data. Again, from my experience, companies are very, Swiss companies are quite far away from being compliant here. So the big one probably, you know, the compliance with GDPR, but if you're a middle-sized company, just check your privacy notice. And if you don't have any, uh, it's really the time, it's really time to have it there. And then for processes, you need processes, you need a security measures. I mean, those are like principles that are in GDPR and are quite standard. If you start a compliance program, then you will you will go through that. You will need to be able to show the authorities that you are um, in the process of being um, compliant or you have your, your data, I would say, in order. And I leave it to you, Giancarlo, I think. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I would like now to share with you some uh, real life use cases to highlight the major changes from the revision of the uh, Federal Act on Data Protection 
which is largely inspired by the European GDPR. So uh, let's have a look on how the new regulation can impact businesses, but also customers. So of course, uh, this is not an exhaustive list of use cases as we have a limited amount of time. And for some of you who have already worked on the European regulation, this will not be, let's say, totally new. But it is new actually for the consumer in Switzerland. And this will uh, certainly imply a major behavioral change. So our first example here concerns direct marketing. Uh, we are well aware of such practices as a prospect or as a client when we are contacted by telemarketeers willing to sell us a product or when we receive promotional emails from, uh, let's say, different brands. So this will become a major shift uh, for consumers in Switzerland with the new FADP because as a consumer, I will be obliged to provide my consent. So this is mandatory to share my personal data. Otherwise, it will be quite simple. Uh, I will no longer receive uh, any communications or I will no longer be contacted by these brands because by default, I am not supposed right, to be registered in any commercial list without my approval. So this is certainly a new constraint for brands because before contacting prospects or customers, they will need to collect uh, this explicit consent, which was not really mandatory prior to the revision. And so here we can uh, sum up with uh, new rules of engagement that are being created with uh, tighter, but also clearer constraints in terms of uh, communication. So our next example is when we are browsing um, a website or a mobile application. So brands must notify visitors that uh, part of their behavior is being tracked. And even if they do so, just to per personalize, let's say, their experience. So the main point here is that uh, brands must now have a cookie consent banner or an ID in case of uh, mobile phones, because it is required that they collect the user's consent as his or her behavior is being tracked and uh, whether it is for statistical or advertising purposes. Otherwise, they will no longer have the right to do so. So if we do a focus on cookies, there is a subtle difference uh, between the, um, the revised FADP and the European GDPR. So even if the main principles remain the same, uh, according to the Swiss regulation, brands must provide informational text and must collect an opt-in, which in this case of the FADP, it does not need to be expressed. So we can choose how our personal data will be used whether for statistical or for advertising purposes. So the main difference between the Swiss and the European regulation is that in the case of the GDPR, there is a tighter constraint, uh, meaning there is no consent by default, right? So uh, also as a user, I can have the uh, possibility to stop any tracking by myself. So there is a major difference between uh, the two regulations regarding cookie management. And uh, we can say that with the latest uh, directives we have seen from European regulators, uh, this gap will continue to, to evolve. So our third and last example here is the most complex for companies to manage, which is the right to be forgotten. So this is the case when uh, an individual states that uh, he or she no longer wants to receive communication from a company and no longer wants his or her personal data to be used. So in this case, data must be purged or deleted. But with the uh, exception, of course, of transactional data, 
which is used by contracts or in the case of uh, specific verticals where the conservation is required by law. So uh, this is very easy actually for, for the customer to, to ask uh, for uh, the exercise of this right by just writing an email directly to the company's uh, DPO. But uh, as we have seen on the other side, uh, it, it is quite a nightmare actually for companies to, to purge such data because uh, let's say that the IT environment is by nature designed to manage data and not really purge them. So another elegant solution um, would be to anonymize this data, but in general, this requirement remains a, a real challenge for uh, IT managers. So these were the three examples that uh, we wanted to share with you to provide some real life use cases uh, for the consumer. So next, let's have a look of uh, on the corporate side with the compliance toolbox. So by toolbox, I mean in terms of framework and deliverables and not in terms of solution because these will be, of course, presented uh, later on by one trust. So we'll have a quick look on what we should take into account so these uh, privacy requirements uh, can be properly met. So let's go through the three pillars of compliance. So data governance is a very important topic which should not be underestimated. It goes way beyond data protection or data privacy because every organization must have a governance of its data processes, right? So, and be able to manage them appropriately. Uh, so we see a lot of data governance projects. There are lunch following data protection initiatives. And so this really highlights the challenges of governing data in general beyond the personal dimension, right? So including data related to products or contracts, which enlarges uh, the scope uh, considerably. So if we move on to the user experience, so as we have previously seen with the example, to provide a proper experience, uh, we must anticipate the requirements, right? So um, for instance, some companies in Europe have well, well worked on the side and have even developed a uh, competitive advantage thanks to this by being transparent and communicating with their end users uh, proactively. The third part, the third pillar, sorry, is the IT architectural one. So uh, as we have seen uh, with the right to be forgotten, this is where uh, and how we will implement these changes, which are often uh, technically uh, challenging. So if we have a look on the rollout and uh, we have here some of the key steps by pillar, um, but again, these are not exhaustive and they can, of course, vary from B2B to uh, B2C companies. So when it comes to data governance, some important questions we should ask ourselves is, um, how will I define the processes to manage data and how will I integrate with my partners uh, and stakeholders? So um, the marketing team base, which is a great asset for marketing professionals. So how will I manage it? efficiently, right? In the case of uh, user experience, uh, the notion of design of the experience is very important. So uh, for instance, in data privacy projects, we see uh, that uh, A-B testing, for instance, can really max maximize the opt-in. So the way we present and communicate with the customers can uh, greatly impact the results. And finally, the IT architecture. So uh, one of the main questions here is, uh, how will I break down the existing silos? Uh, how do I centralize and manage master data? And of course, uh, different solutions as is. So ranging from uh, consent management platforms to master data management. And so uh, what is important here is to identify and understand uh, your specific needs. So now let's have a look uh, and an overview on the main deliverables. So regarding data governance, um, the data register is really key because 
it is the starting point for managing data. And uh, another important deliverable is the privacy impact assessment, uh, because every project must be assessed based on this document to see if personal data is being generated. Uh, so this includes also, of course, data from employees or partners. And we have also the data transfer uh, agreement to define the terms and conditions uh, while working with our business partners, which is also important to understand who will process and control data. So regarding user experience, um, here the migration of consent is really key. Uh, we can illustrate this with the fact that in uh, 2018 with the GDPR, um, we all received some strange emails from brands telling that they loved us and that they, uh, with a new regulation, we could provide our consent. And so this communication was often uh, unclear. Uh, we didn't really understand the reason some of these brands were reaching us. And in fact, uh, these messages were perceived as spam uh, because in fact, they, they didn't really anticipate this need. So it is important with the uh, revised FADP to be able to prove to regulators that uh, uh, we have also collected consent from, from the users. Uh, otherwise, we can no longer communicate with them once the regulation will come into force. But what is really important here is uh, how I manage my opt-in base and making sure it is properly migrated uh, with the right level of consent so I have to define the right strategy to do so. Well, regarding the RT architecture, this is a very broad subject. Uh, what matters here really is that there is plethora of solutions. So how will I select the proper tool uh, with the required features to do the job is really important. So if we share with you one of the main best practices that uh, we have seen at our clients, uh, this one is to offer a preference center. So um, offering a preference center has many advantages, right? Because it is basically a win-win. So for the brand in terms of data centralization and constant management, uh, the brand will have a 360 view of the customer if uh, it is provided with an omnichannel approach. And for the consumer, uh, as we show, uh, that we manage data, we show that we are uh, using data for particular usages, we are transparent, so we are able to reassure the consumer is always in control and that as a company, we care about his or her data. So to provide you now um, uh, an idea of how to apply some of these concepts in a comp corporate environment, I will uh, pass it on to Carolyn. Thank you, Giancarlo. Um, so I think Giancarlo was able also to demonstrate to you why it's important to use it from a marketing point of view, because again, at the end of the day, you want to be able to talk to your customers and know to whom you can talk and how you can optimize it. From a business um, perspective, and you can move to the next one. Thank you. Um, we wanted to explain to you a case we had with, um, with a client of ours um, who came and said, well, we need to be compliant, not just because we like to be compliant or we said, okay, that's what we need to do in 2020, but we are filing an RFP or we're filing, a, you know, we're participating to an RFP to get a mandate from a um, large customer. And this customer is asking us a lot of questions about our protection and we cannot answer to this question because we are not ready and we don't have the right documentation in place. So this company was an international group with several entities in, in Europe and outside Europe. They were working in a highly competitive sector. They didn't have a strict process with regard to the protection of personal data. They were probably managing okay, I would say, on an ad hoc basis, but nothing uh, put in place. They couldn't evidence any documentation, written documentation. They didn't have anything on their website explaining kind of to the world how they pro uh, process data. And um, across the group, they didn't have any agreement that uh, were allowing them to, um, to share information and transfer data. So what we've done was actually rather simple, but there are a few steps to, to, um, to take and follow. The first one is really uh, starting with 
the mapping of the ent entities. Who is there? Who is doing what? Who has access to what? Who needs to have access? It sounds easy, but sometimes it's it's uh, it takes a lot of time to do this because uh, we don't realize how much data, personal data is um, shared among entities of a group. Then we did a da data inventory, as also Giancarlo was mentioning. It's, it is important to have this um, this inventory, and Julia will also come uh, later with the different tools to do that, which is also um, a list of the different activities we do in HR, marketing, finance, um, sales, um, to uh, process data. We did update uh, the agreements they had. Oh, sorry. Can I just come back? We did update the agreements that they had with the different providers uh, by having the right data protection clause in it. We worked on the website compliance with the privacy notice and the different disclaimers that are needed when you have a contact form, when, you, when someone wants to register for a newsletter. And then at the end of the day, we were also able to uh, value these efforts by saying, you will now be able to go into all the RFPs and ensure that you have done the work and then your company is more valuable because then you know how you're doing things. So also think about all of this compliance program as, as an added value that you, um, you will fund your company and not just as something you need to go through and tick the box. Yes, thank you. Um, any compliance program, according to, to um, our knowledge, needs to follow steps. Um, you need to have a pilot, pilot in the plane, definitely a, a DPO or a team. A team is also okay. The mapping I mentioned is very important. And the third step is the priorities. Where, what industry are you activating? What are the priorities? Sometimes it's easier to say we need to start with the website. We need to start with the third parties. We need to start with the employees data. And then you can really plan your program in a way that is not overwhelming. The risks are important. They definitely depend on your industry and on um, the, 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 let's say the maturity of risk or the risk you're ready to take within your company. There will be always risk of cyber, you know, cyber attacks, etc. It's how you can mitigate them and how you anticipate this risk. And finally, the process that um, were also raised by Giancarlo and will also be raised by Julia. It's important to have processes in place. It's not just one time um, shot, but it's a long term project. It's a never ending project, honestly, to say it this way. Um, and you need also to plan this in your, uh, in your budget and in the resources you have. And the last one I want to mention yeah, on the next slide um, is. Um, the abandonment of the Swiss US privacy shield. So last um, last summer, we learned that Europe was, um, oh, the U U U um, um, and authorities were um, denying actually the validity of the um, um, US privacy shield, EU US privacy shield, uh, which means also that Switzerland followed and, and said it's not enough. This framework mechanism is not enough to protect the right of our um, individual and residents. So um, we need to find another solution. There are alternatives. And in um, this month of June, we got the new standard uh, contractual clause from Europe that will be also recognized by Switzerland. So that's a good, um, good news. Um, and then the um, um, Data Protection um, uh, Commissioner in Switzerland has also released the guide. And I will put the link into the chat later on how you process um, personal data with providers located outside the EU, outside Switzerland, who don't have an adequate protection um, level um, for, um, for personal data. So this is a whole new topic. I know some people here, especially in big companies, they're quite uh, involved with that because um, uh, there, there are um, 11, 18 months now to, uh, to change, for example, the standard contractual clauses. Um, but I would also say here, take one step after the other and then uh, assess with whom you're working. Last point, I would say, if you can choose between a US provider and an EU provider, from a legal side, it might be a little bit easier with an EU provider, but that's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So um, please bear in mind that we have here a chat. So if 
you have any questions, please feel free. We'll try to ad address these uh, by the end of the session. So if I can conclude, let's say, uh, before uh, Julie's presentation, I'd like to share with you uh, two examples of, uh, of, of uh, uh, big companies that, uh, because data protection, let's say, matters to us as consumers, but also, of course, matters to big tech, right? So the GAFAs. And so here in this case, what happened to Facebook uh, some months ago with uh, WhatsApp, uh, when they reach users for uh, consent regarding new privacy policies, uh, we have seen that many chose actually to, to leave this free service. So what we need here to uh, keep in mind is that in general, consumers are increasingly aware of their data rights and they no longer accept uh, all kinds of practices or uh, policies. So if I move on with the next example, which concerns Apple, um, we have here the example of the IDFA, which is the identifier for advertisers, which can now be blocked by default with the new iOS. So uh, why is this important? Because it implies a major shift for ad firms and app developers as the consumer that is, let's say, not really data savvy or well-informed is, like, is likely to block this feature. And uh, this means that, of course, uh, these companies will have less tracking uh, capabilities, but also uh, less data for, for, for brands to analyze. So, in this case, Apple, we can say, uh, would have more uh, power over the data within their platform. So uh, why not, let's say, progressively become a one-stop shop for user data? So this is one position that can be uh, put in place. So we will not share really our position on that. But what is important here is that, uh, of course, it is uh, important to keep these changes in mind because we have a really evolving environment. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, let the floor to, to Julia, who is going to present you the solutions from OneTrust. Thank you, Giancarlo. Um, all right, so let's start um, talking about OneTrust. Um, so who are we? Who is OneTrust? Um, as I mentioned briefly uh, in the beginning of the presentation, so we are uh, one of the leaders in terms of solutions to help uh, every single company be compliant on various different use cases. So how do we exactly do this? Um, we um, first of all start with understanding uh, your data. So how do we do this? We connect with all of your different solutions internally to understand where your data sits, where it's being transferred, uh, whether you're compliant or not. Um, so really understanding your data is the first step. And then the second, date, uh, the second step really is to then once you know where your data sits, how can you be compliant? And we do this through our uh, OneTrust data guidance um, platform which really helps you understand um, yeah, where you need to, um, you know, where you need to fill the gaps, basically. And then once you have this middle piece with both um, knowing your data and knowing your laws, then we can start also completing everything uh, with all the different use cases that we have, starting from the most important one, um, the OneTrust privacy. Um, this is the one we started from in the beginning. Um, and uh, it is I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to stop this for a second. Okay, we had some technical difficulties. This is, of course, the very well known demo effect. So, Julia will be yep. uh, coming back. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I had a, a little a music problem, no problem in the background. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so the the privacy piece here on the top right hand side, which is basically covering anything that has to do with Article 30, um, your data mapping, basically, um, and this is usually for yeah the security teams, but also most importantly legal teams or DPOs. 
But then we also cover very importantly on the right hand side, right next to it in gray, we have one trust preference choice, which really covers anything that has to do with um, um, getting consent from your customers. So consent on your cookie banners, but consent also in terms of marketing, um, you know, the newsletters that they're getting, everything that we just spoke about earlier as well, which on Carlo um, and uh, Caroline as well. So um, yeah. So, so we, we cover that as well. Um, very important as well is the OneTrust data go uh, governance. The data governance piece is anything that has to do with a data catalog. So understanding where your data sits, but also in every single um, you know, um, uh, team uh, within your whole company uh, and understanding also what the different, the different metadata you have as well to make sure that you're compliant and that you're not um, overstocking, but that you're also purging the data that you don't need. Um, and then we also have OneTrust GRC, which is anything that has to do with uh, risk and compliance. So it's IT risk, but it's also enterprise risk. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of also important things here. Usually we we cover those with the IT teams or the CISO um, as well. Then we have the OneTrust Vendorpedia uh, in blue. Um, which really covers anything that has to do with um, third party risk. So not it's not enough to be compliant to yourselves with your own data mapping and all of your data, but also understanding who you're working with, um, who are your vendors and whether they are compliant or not, or whether tomorrow if they have a leak, uh, are you sure uh, to say that your data is also being protected if that happens? Um, and then on the right hand side, in, in terms of ethics, we also cover a big piece here um, where we also just acquired the leaders in this field. So uh, called Conversant, uh, which we acquired two years ago, uh, two, sorry, two months ago. Um, and that covers anything that has to do with whistleblowing, uh, with the Loi Sapin 2 in France as well. Um, so also very, very important. Uh, we're seeing a lot of traction there, as well as One Trust ESG, which is a our latest piece um, in green um, that we've also added. So anything that has to do with sustainability um, within your companies as well. So very, very important. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so the first piece we're really gonna focus on today is um, so anything that has to do particularly with the fundamentals. So privacy, the article 30 and uh, your records. So how does this work? So you need to keep a data inventory and mapping. So this is also what um, um, what Caroline also spoke about earlier. But the main importance here is to understand, you know, how many processing activities do you have? Are they compliant or not? Do you know whether there are risks or not? Have you uh, created some DPIAs to really identify all the risks? It's really important. So how we're going to do this with OneTrust is, first of all, we're going to understand your data. So populate your data inventory with, for example, imports or APIs or plugging into all of your different um, systems internally, and then create this one-stop shop within OneTrust to have all your data and understand it with a lot of uh, different reportings. Um, understand the, the once we have this data, we will be able to automate uh, your gap identification. So understand with uh, a lot of intelligence and our AI uh, robotic, which is called Athena, uh, where your risks lie and whether you're doing any cross-border data transfers um, as well, because this is really important uh, to know based on also, again, what um, Caroline said earlier with uh, SHREMS 2 being invalidated last uh, August. You need to know whether you are doing any cross-border data transfers of your um, um, of your processing activities to the US. So then we also have gener we generate reports and have this really nice, um, we visualize data on these really simple to use um, dashboards where you'll be able to um, you know, create all of these uh, cross-border data maps, understand uh, how many processing activities you have, which one are um, at risk, um, and understand whether you need to do any PIAs or DPIAs and where all your uh, data uh, lies in different countries. Um, and then of course, last piece, maintaining compliance. Um, so being able to send out these D, uh, PIAs or DPIAs automatically um, when, for example, a processing activity has uh, a high level of risk, being able to, to, to be uh, you know, 
right on time and being ha having one trust basically do this automatically for you. So sending out a PIA based on this processing activity because it's intelligent and it knows that there are high risks involved. So it will really take out all of that manual piece for you uh, and make it um, easier for you to, to know where, where, you're, where you're at, whether you're maturing in terms of all your processing activities as well. And so this sits on a privacy arch architecture, which is completely dynamically linked. Um, so with throughout time, you'll always be able to, um, you know, follow through with all of your different um, processing activities, uh, make sure that, you know, everybody else in your company is also helping you with that through assessments as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the next slide. Oh. A bit further. Um, so first, uh, the the mappings. So we have an asset map, which again will help you understand where your data sits. So in a very nice um, view, you'll be you'll you'll know. For example, here you can see we, you have nine different assets, and assets are IT um, or different types of um, places where you hold data. So this could be Microsoft Outlook if you're using Microsoft Outlook, for example. It could be um, you know a Salesforce if you're using it as your CRM and where it all sits. So you can see here, for example, in the US, we have nine of those. Um, and then I believe one in Switzerland as well. Um, and then for the cross cross border data map. So again, you need to be able to to say where your data sits, but also whether you are doing any data transfers, um, especially outside. So from the EU and through to outside the EU. And right now also the big, big, uh, big talks are about uh, Schrems 2 being invalidated and the SEC clause um, as well. So being able to know whether you're doing any processing activities that have this uh, cross-border uh, flow. And I just wanted to point out here because I know that uh, with the experience that I've had, a lot of our customers sometimes say, "Yeah, but you know, we don't do any cross-border data flow um, flows with um, with the U.S." Yes, okay, maybe not straight away, but do you use Google? Do you use um, you know Microsoft? Most of those have servers in the U.S., and if you are using them and the servers are in the U.S., then technically you are doing these cross-border data transfers. So. I would say a lot of companies even don't even don't even don't know that they're doing these cross-border data transfers yet. So that's something you really need to get um, you know visualize first and know, and then be able to be compliant to uh, 100%. Um, and then we have this also this nice data lineage uh, uh, flowchart. So this will really help you with each and every single uh, processing activity. You'll be able to know what the data life cycle uh, is for this processing activity. So where your data comes from, so which type of consumers you have, um, and then the source of collection of the data all the way up until the archiving or destruction of your data. So this is really a nice clear view to be able to send out to your different teams we often see this um you know with through my experience i see this also with uh it teams uh you know when 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 the dpo says yeah you know my other teams don't really know what i'm doing this is really helpful for the it teams to be able to to understand you know what's happening within um within the company and how is the data being transferred Um, and then gallery wise, so also wanted to mention that within OneTrust, we have a very um, a big gallery of different integrations that are out of the box. So we have about 500 integrations that already exist. Um, and those could range from, um, you know, IT applications to servers to, um, you know, databases, things like that. So, um, you know, we can really connect also to all of your different uh, internal systems in order to discover and understand where your data sits and then bring it all back into a single source of truth, which is uh, OneTrust. Um, in terms of um, PIAs and uh, privacy by design assessment, so that's something also that I, we see going more and more, um, you know, with time, it's becoming very, very important, especially within, you know, the GDPR as well. So um, this will also be something you will be able to do with OneTrust. Yeah. 
So through assessments, you'll be able to assess uh, privacy by design questionnaires to understand you know, whether you are doing this privacy by design from the start or not, um, whether um, uh, whether you're compliant on all of your different uh, processing activities and also your assets, so your IT records, uh, and then also be able to bring out these um, BI PIAs or DPIAs. Um, so this is just an example to show you how um, the, an, an, assess, an assessment could look like. Uh, we have really these amazing types of assessments where you'll be able to send those out to your different teams internally, uh, but also externally. Um, so the you know, users are, don't need to be on uh, one trust to answer these questions. But the point here really is to understand whether if tomorrow your HR team is doing a new campaign to uh, recruit people while they are doing a, pro a new processing activity and you need to be aware of that. So what happens is you can send them this assessment. All they need to do is fill it out and then you'll get it back with the answers. You'll be able to review it and then, um, you know, and then follow through with it and submit it. And once that's done, then it will automatically populate back into all of your processing activities or create uh, a new processing activity for you. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, but I think this is also a very important piece to mention. So the uh, cookie consent, uh, this is something that, you know, again, OneTrust does very, very well. We are the number one um, CMP, um, so consent management platform out there, um, which is the most used in the world. Uh, you know, we cover all types of different industries uh, and whether large or small companies as well. Um, so the way we do this is really, first of all, we scan websites to understand what your trackers are. So cookies, but also tags and different types of things that are on your, um, your website. And then we categorize those automatically through our, um, through our robot called uh, Cookiepedia. Um, and then we'll also be able to help you with anything that has to do with the banner and the preference layout with really, really simple clicks. There's not a lot of, um, you know, heavy customization that you need to do. There's basically none. It's a lot of clicks. So it will really, um, you know, help you get on board really quickly. Um, we have the auto uh, cookie auto blocking as well, uh, which will um, automatically block uh, all the cookies uh, where consent are not given. So this is also important to prove this. We have a dynamic cookie policy as well. So the put cookie policy will automatically uh, adapt itself every time you do a new scan on your website and new trackers are being found. And then the last piece, which is also the most important, uh, is understanding through reports how you're doing uh, on your cookie banner and all the consent that you're getting. So how much consent are you getting on your cookie banners, the A-B testing that you might be doing on your banners, um, and then also the amount of consent you're getting yeah, um, you know, throughout. Uh, yeah, so this is just a quick view on how um, it looks like on OneTrust, but yeah, just know that it's the audit and you'll be able to redo this audit as much as you want. Uh, you'll be able to get back all the different types of cookies, internal cookies, external cookies, so third-party cookies as well, and you'll be able to also export this, um, this view as well. Um, yeah, and so these are the different things that you can do. Also, just wanted to mention, we have a multilingual option. So, of course, we cover almost all the languages in the world um, to be able to, you know, make sure that you're, um, you know, responding to all of your uh, clients worldwide and also not just the language, but also the consent model option. So opt in, opt out. It's uh, I know we're speaking mostly in Switzerland now about, you know, very closely related to GDPR. So we have this consent model, but we have also other um uh, consent model options. Um, and again, as I promised you earlier, it is a simple, simple click. So this is how it looks like to create your banner. You really just choose your positions. Um, and then also the reports um, that you'll be able to find here uh, with a lot of nice dashboards and you'll be able to do some A-B testing here as well. Um, vendors uh, as well. So last piece here on the vendor side, uh, wanted to let you know that we do basically everything that has to do from the beginning, starting uh, when you onboard a vendor all the way through to um, uh, offboarding a vendor. So we have here nice dashboards that will also show you, you know, the uh, critical levels of the different vendors you work with, whether there are risks involved as well, or, you know, other types of things uh, uh, here. 
uh, and of course your vendor list uh, understanding um, you know, for this particular vendor, for example, here we see it's Atlassian where you sit. So in the workflow where uh, we, we completed the evaluation and we also found all the risks that were uh, related back to Atlassian. Yeah, and uh, next piece, pre-completed assessment. So we have, yeah, you can go to the next slide. We have uh, about 65,000 um, vendors that already exist in our uh, exchange piece in Vendorpedia. So this means that, you know, more with time, more and more of our um, clients ask us to add some more vendors. So just know that here, what's interesting um, is that you'll have a full view on each of these vendors. So if you go on the next slide as well, Giancarlo, yeah, you'll be able to here view the different certificates that your vendors hold. Uh, you'll be able to send them specific assessments, whether, you know, if, uh, as you see here with uh, Run Trust data guidance, You'll also have a lot of different uh, articles, the latest articles that we'll talk to you about, you know, the, the fines that were sent out uh, to Google, uh, you know, all the different in interesting facts about Google in order for you to be able to uh, understand, you know, where you sit with Google and whether, you know, there's been a, a leakage of data or whatever, and then you can also send them assessments. Perfect. And that's it. Thank you very much, Julia, for, for the presentation. And uh, now let's see if we can address some of these questions because we are running out of time. So um, many people here asking us if uh, the slides will be shared after this meeting. Of course, everything is being recorded and we provide it for you. Um, do the other participants see questions that they are willing to address? I might have one here, which says, okay, this is a tough one. It's a very good one. How long does it take uh, for a company to uh, be compliant? Wow, this is, this is complex. So I think that one of the factors might be uh, your business activities, right? So uh, your customer base. So if you are already working with e-residents, you have already done most of this GDPR compliance, it will be uh, fairly easy for you to be compliant. But if you are, let's say, a, a Swiss company and you have only uh, Swiss residents, that will take uh, a little bit more time and it will also depend, of course, on your size. So uh, a startup could uh, start with uh, some deliverables around Microsoft PowerPoint and, and Excel sheets, et cetera. But if you are, let's say a four to 500, so a very large corporation with uh, uh, multiple partners and so on, uh, their uh, consulting uh, assessment might be required. So we, we could talk here about a, a mandate around, let's say a hundred K. I hope this was clear for you as an answer. Do we have other questions? We're, we have one minute left. Okay, perfect. We have no more questions here. Um, I will then uh, leave, leave you guys to go back to your activities and uh, I am willing to thank you all for participating uh, to this webinar with us. And please uh, make sure that uh, if you have any questions later on, you can reach us to us on social media. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good day.